Mississippi and Lincoln. They've been in, involved in Chi Alpha in Omaha, and uh, they've also been pastors of the Shadron Community Church. And uh, they are kind of like longtime <laughs> friends of our house here. How many of you have, have, minist- have been ministered to by Kevin and Kate before? Look at all these hands, yeah. And uh, so we just want to thank the Lord through, through for Kevin and Kate and for the work he's doing in and through them. And we also want to pray for them. So let's just re- stretch out our hands to them right now. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for Kevin and Kate. We thank you for their family, their, their, their um, daughter and son, both in college right now. We ask for you just to continue doing mighty work through them and, and in this family. Lord, we bless them, and we ask that as... As uh, Kevin comes up, Lord, that, that your spirit would just uh, hover over him, that, that he would just be hearing the things you're speaking today. And we just bless him. God, we just want to remember that, that he is not the object of our uh, attention. You are. But he's a servant that you work through. And we just welcome and, um, and receive the gift of God to us today through Kevin and Kate. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So after the service, I, I talked to Kevin, there will be time. Uh, we're not going to rush out of here. And if you do desire to receive prayer and personal ministry, hang out. We'll try to cut it off around 1230 because uh, we're going to probably go out to uh, lunch. I'm not sure if, we, if we're going to do Sam and Louise yet, but uh, if you want to join us at lunch, you're welcome to do that. Yes, Crystal. Uh, write it to the church and just put how much to him, how much you're tithed if you're doing the check for both. Otherwise, individually, just write it to the church and we'll write one check to him. All right, thank you. You got your mic. Hey, before Pastor Jim slips over away, can you come here for a sec? Yeah. Um, in a time where pastors come and go frequently or they're leaving the ministry in droves, I just want to be able to recognize Jim and Brooke um, for their steadfastness and their faithfulness to God, uh, to serve you, to bless you uh, as your pastor. I just want to be able to honor them. Would you give Pastor uh, Brooke, Pastor Jim, a hand clap and an applause? You have... We've traveled a lot of places, different states, different churches. You have an amazing uh, set of pastors here that just have an incredible heart for God, but even more evidence, a heart for people um, in, in what they're doing. And so thank you for your, for your work here. Okay, so I need help with this. Uh, Francisco, would you do me a favor? Would you come right over here by this very important um, piece of equipment? And I want you to play blocker, okay? So right about here. Don't let anybody bump into you, but step over just a little bit. Okay. Is it on? There we go. All right. And Jennifer, would you be over on this side? Now, if you're a kid in here that's under the age of 16, can you stand up right now? Okay. All right, if you're under the age of 16, would you come up to the front? It's very important. I've got something for you here, okay? So come on up to the front. So... For today's message, we're going to start off in a certain way. Are you ready? I need some over here, some over here. And if you're a bigger kid, play nice up here, okay? But bigger kids over here. Okay, you're over that way. Little kids down here. Come on down. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to count to three. And when I say three, I want you to run around all over the place up here, okay? But don't bump into anyone, and don't bump into Francisco and the the equipment here. Ready? One, two, three. Come on, run around. Let's go, guys. I think the little kids are outpacing the big kids. The big kids don't know there's a $100 prize for this. $200 prize. 
300. Oh, they're motivated. Come on. Run around, kids. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. I got my fast shoes on today. Do you have your fast shoes on? Okay, come on. So here's what's going to happen. While I'm preaching, the kids are going to run around up front while I'm preaching, okay? Does that sound like a good plan? No? Okay. Kids, if you're, if you're able to sit up front away from your parents, you're welcome to sit up here. These are reserved for you. And little kids, if you want to sit back with mom and dad, that would be just fine. Go ahead and take a seat. Go ahead. So you're probably asking yourself, why did I do that? Partly because it ties into our message today. Last week, Pastor Jim uh, preached on Ruth and Boaz out of the Old Testament. And I don't know if you know about that time period, but that was in the time of Judges. And during that time, it was kind of chaos. It was kind of like that a little bit spiritually. People would just come and go, do as they please, run back and forth. I don't know why I'm breathing heavy. I bike. I shouldn't be breathing heavy. But the story of Ruth and Boaz is a story of God's faithfulness, and it foreshadows Jesus' faithfulness in the New Testament to be our Redeemer. This was a time where the Israelites didn't have Moses. They didn't have Joshua. They didn't have these preeminent leaders that were leading them through the times. But instead, they found themselves in the time of judges. Can you say judges? Judges. Judges. So a little background. In the time of judges, this was 325 years before the time of the kings. Okay? Can somebody tell me the first king that was anointed over Israel? Saul. Very good. So it said, the scripture says in Judges 21, verse 25, in those days, Israel had no king. No king. Everyone did as they saw fit. So up here, when everybody's running around like chickens with their heads cut off, that's kind of what people were doing spiritually. They just did as they saw fit. If they were doing wicked, they did wicked. If they were doing good, they did good. They just did their own thing. Some of the younger crowd would be like, you do you, boo. Right now, if we had the kids running crazy up here, how many of you as parents or adults out there would start getting irritated if I'm trying to preach up here and the kids are still running? Raise your hand. Oh, sure you would, right? But even in God's wisdom, during the time of Judges, even though people were running around like kids with their, with their feet a flurry, he knew that he had things under control. So during that time period, there was chaos, there was confusion, and there was disorder. And do you know what else they had? They had sin. When Israel did as they saw fit, they fell into sin. There was a pattern in the book of Judges, kind of a, a cycle. Can you say cycle? Not by, not by cycle, but cycle that they would go through. So is there a kid in here that's kind of ornery, aside from me? Here, come on up here. What's your name? Ariana. Ariana. Come on up here. Come on up here. I like you. Are you coming up here too? Yeah. What's your name? Uh, Lena. Lena? Luna. Luna. Okay. Ariana and Luna. So, you're kind of ornery? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, gal, the gallery has spoken. Well, you know what? There's, there's hope for you because even God used even um, thieves and liars and assassins and all sorts of people to be judges. 
Judges weren't even perfect. Are you ornery or are you a sweetie? Are you sweet? Are you nice? You're nice? You're nice? Yeah. That's nice. So, let me ask you, do you ever get in trouble at home? <laughs> Almost every day. Really? So, well, so, do you just get to like do whatever you want and you never get in trouble? Oh, there's consequences? My, my parents are preparing me to have children. <laughs> okay, so, so let's see if there's a pattern here. Okay. So, so if you do something wrong, then what happens? I get a long talk. Get a long yeah, talk. talk. So you, <laughs> you get corrected. So you get corrected, right? And then what happens if you keep doing it? So then there's more cons then there's more consequences. So but here's here's the problem. So you have loving parents that actually want to do something so that you're not just a naughty, naughty kid, right? I know, I know they do that. They love you, right? They tell me all the time. Okay. Isn't that right? So is it a good thing? Hang on. Hang with me. Is it a good thing that they correct you then? Obviously, of course. Exactly. So do you ever get in trouble? Yeah. Do you have to go in time out? No. No? <laughs> See, and there might be a difference. So how old are you? Ten. Okay, how old are you? Uh, three. You're this many? Yeah. Okay, so if... She does something at age three, and parents say, hey, stop that. But she's not really old enough to know that she's not doing something right. I think it's maybe 15, 15 years old. Kind of like that, right? Yeah. But if you do it, will the parents tell you, come on, you yeah. know better? <laughs> will they tell you that? I mean, Mom's back there going like this, nodding her head yeah, big time. It'll take about like 15 days to get over with it. Right. So... So I just want you to look at this. There's not a lot of difference between how we act when we're kids and how Israel was acting with their relationship with God. Okay, you sweeties can have a seat. Can you give them a hand? See, they were acting badly too. Israel wasn't listening to the laws. They weren't trying to obey and then they would just kind of wander off and do their own thing. So the pattern typically was this. Israel serves God and experiences peace. It's a good thing. Israel does evil in the sight of God and sins. Number three, Israel experiences distress, war, and a lot of times, you know what happened? They had to go and be slaves to some other people group because God was like, well, you know what? If you're going to do wrong, you're going to have to face the consequences. And then if you were put in the timeout, just, just a quick question. If you were put in the timeout for, let's say six hours, would you be crying out to your parents to let you out of timeout? What about three hours? Exactly. So Israel was the same way, except sometimes it would take them 50 years, 60 years, 70 years to start crying out to God to do something because it's, the conditions were so bad. So they would cry out, and then God would raise up. Can you say raise up? God would raise up a leader in the form of a judge. And then lastly, he would rescue and deliver Israel. Some of the judges include, can you guys think of any judges? Do you know any judges? Is that a judge here? Okay. 
So one of the, some of the judges in the Old Testament are Deborah, Gideon, this long-haired guy that had a lot of strength. I'm trying to remember what his name is. Oh, what's his name? Samson, that's right. So God would use them to help deliver Israel and get them back in relationship. Can you say relationship? Relationship, relationship with God. So I've got to come over here for just a second. My notes tell me this. What's your name? Hi, TJ. My name's Kevin. It's good to see you. Hi, what's your name? Mira? My name's Kevin. Good to meet you. What's your name? Izzy. Izzy? My name's Kevin. Good to meet you. Hi, kid. What's your name? Hi, Jennifer. Kevin, good to meet you. You're probably asking yourself, man, this guy's weird. Well, we already know that. It's established. He's weird. But part of the reason that I did that was a special reason. So if I just talked at you this morning, right, would you leave here out those doors and go, you know what? Kevin really wanted to get to know me. No, probably not, because I didn't even take the time to come over here and get TJ's name, right? But there's something important that sometimes we pause long enough in our life to go up and know people by name. Because God desires to do that very thing, to know us by name, and so that more so that we know. God's number one desire is for us to enjoy a relationship with him as much as as much in the Old Testament as we have today. That was his desire, and he wanted people to know him and know his peace and know his faithfulness and know his provision. That brings us to the story today. That story is Samuel hears God's voice. So, kiddos, if you're a kiddo in the room, I want you to raise your hands like this. I know some older kiddos. Okay, I want you to cup your hands like this, and I want you to click your listening ears on. Okay, so the whole rest of the the sermon, you're going to hold your hands like this and see if you hear better. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Now, speaking... Speaking of ears, you know, this part of your ear right here, it's important. And so, if there's anybody that ever has, like, ears that stick out farther from their head, did you know anatomically and physiologically that helps you hear better? Did you know that? So, I found this really handsome photo of this pastor guy here. It's true. Not up? Darn it. What about the other one? Okay. You know what? We're going to go old school with this. So I found this photo of this handsome guy right here. Okay. Just make sure that we see it, right? So, could you imagine if Jim had his listening ears on all the time? Could you imagine what that would look like? Here, I'll show you. There you go. Nice stuff, huh, Pastor Jim? But imagine if that was Pastor Jim's heart for God. He was like, I want to have my listening ears on all the time to hear God's voice. Do you think God would say, you know what? I want to talk to that Pastor Jim guy because he actually wants to hear what I have to say. He probably would. Let's dive in to this morning's message by opening up your Bible, your personal device. If you're online, uh, being able to turn to 1 Samuel chapter. Uh, two.
As, there, as you're flipping, we'll get that pulled up here. All right, kiddos. Actually, let's go First Samuel chapter 1. My apologies. I'm going to flip it around here. So in verse 3, it says, Now the boy Samuel... Uh, wrong spot. Sorry. There we go. Technology issues. Verse 2. So we're talking, actually, we'll go first one. Uh, we're going to have a gentleman, and we're going to call him Mr. Elk. Can you say Mr. Elk? Mr. Elk. Mr. Elk. Mr. Elkana. So Mr. Elk. Can you say Mr. Elk? There's a certain man, and he had two wives. The name of one of his wives was Hannah. Can you say Hannah? Yeah. The name of the other is Penina, Peninab. Um, so we'll call her Penny. Can you say Penny? Penny. Penny. So here's a guy who had two wives. Now, some of you are going, wait a second. Two wives? Well, in the Old Testament, it was common practice that you, sometimes that men would have more than one wife. Nowadays, different story in the Church of Christ. Um, so we've got Penny. Now this man used to go up year by year from the city, verse 3, to worship, to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where two sons of Eli, can you say Eli? Eli, Eli was a judge. Can you say that really low? Eli was a judge. Close. All right. So Eli was a judge. He had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who were priests of the Lord. Verse 4. On the day where Mr. Elk... Verse 4. On the day Mr. Elk sacrificed, he would give portions to Penny, his wife, and he would give portions to his other wife and all of her sons and daughters. Verse 5, but to Hannah, he gave a double portion. Anybody know what a double portion is? Twice as much. Would you like a double portion of French fries? Yes. Okay, just checking. Oh, a double portion of donuts. Hit me. Because he loved her, he loved Hannah, though the Lord had closed her womb. Okay, so what this means is, can I see one of those? Oh, so sweet. Oh, this is such a precious baby here. Oh, I never had to have one of these in one of those classes, so I never got the pleasure of this thing screaming at me. So Hannah couldn't have a baby. Her womb was closed. Did I do it right? It's been years. <laughs> Verse 7, So it went on year by year, as often as they went to the house of the Lord, she, Penny, used to provoke her, Hannah, Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. So here you have two wives. One of them is like this, eh, eh, teasing the other. Hannah is sad, weeping. Verse 8, Mr. Elk, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? 
Verse 9, after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose, and now Eli, the priest, who was also a judge, Eli was a judge. So she goes up to Eli. You know I'm only doing that for the adults in the room, right? Okay, just checking. Now Eli was the priest, and he was sitting in the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. I come to think about this. You can follow me for a second. I come to think about this, and I'm like, here's a priest that could be doing any sort of thing in the temple, ministering, doing all of these different things to the Lord. And instead, he's kind of sitting here as if he's a bouncer to the door charging admission. Do you think that's the best use of his skill set, his title, his calling. No, not necessarily. So here Eli sees Hannah. She's distressed and she's praying to the Lord. And she wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, this is one of the most important things. If you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. That means she's committing that if she has a son, that she will give it to the Lord to serve all of his life. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Maria, can I borrow you for a sec? Okay. So imagine Maria is Hannah, and I'm Eli, and she's in the temple, and you're praying, but your heart is hurting. It's crushed. You've had no kids. Do you think you would stand there and just pray, uh, thank you, Lord, I would really like a... What would, what would prayer look like? Crushed, right? So here's Eli. Here's... Hannah, in a vulnerable moment, go ahead and... So imagine if you're Eli. You have choices. You're a priest. So you could come up here and be a blessing. That was part of the priestly duty, was to dispense God's blessing, to be that intermediary between God, to release blessing, to release His heart, to be that conduit of His love, His grace, His goodness. And instead... What's the Scripture say that Eli does? Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved, kind of trembled, and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought that she was drunk. Here she has a crushed spirit. I'm Eli. I have a chance to come up and be a blessing, but instead I misinterpret it completely because I think she's drunk in the temple. And Eli said to her, How long will you continue being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I'm a woman troubled in spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. So I think the moral of that part of it I'm going to draw is you really should go out to eat after church and fellowship and, and put on a happy face. Not really, but... They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord, and then they went back to their house. And Mr. Elk knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Now really what this says is they left the temple, had God's blessing, and God said, I want you to go home and have special time with each other. Adults, special time with each other intimately. It's the one time where a priest is like, go home and be blessed to do that. 
And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel. For, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. So Hannah dedicates Samuel to the Lord. In verse 11, Mr. Elk went to Ramah, but the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest. But we have a problem. Have you ever watched a movie and the music changes and it gets a little more ominous? Or in the 60s kind of cartoonish stuff, it would be dun-dun-dun. Can you do that with me? Dun-dun-dun. Or if you watch Jaws, it was dun 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 So you knew something was up. So Hannah decides to dedicate Samuel to the Lord. But in 1 Samuel chapter 2, we read more about Eli had some wicked scoundrel sons. Can you say wicked scoundrel? In verse 12, Eli's sons were scoundrels. They had no regard for God, no regard for the Lord. Now, it was the practice of the priests that whenever any of the people offered a sacrifice, the priest servant would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand while the meat was being boiled. So I want you to imagine you guys come up. I'm just going to shake your hand. Good to see you. So imagine you've worked hard all week, all season, and then you come to bring your sacrifice into the temple. So if I recall, if you were going to bring a sacrifice, it was supposed to be unblemished. You're not bringing junk to God, right? You're bringing him the, the fattest calf or fattest thing that you can offer, and you bring that in, right? And then the priest takes your offering he blesses it, places it over the fire, or in this case, in a pot, and then that's offered up to God. But the pot was really for the priests. Their job was to get it up on the fire. Who was that offering for? Who was that supposed to go to? That was supposed to go to God. But something was really wrong with these boys. These boys, when it says scoundrel, you ever been in a kitchen and mom and dad are cooking and they're in the middle of cooking and maybe they have cookies or something and you want to, they're mixing cookies and they're working on it and you kind of go like this and you're like, and you sneak up and you try to get like a spoonful of the cookies. I don't know about you, but I tried to do that once, and my mom was prepared. So I went like this, I'm sneaking in, I go to grab, and wham! I found out what a wooden spoon on your hand feels like when she's already told you three times, no, don't get, don't get your hand in the cookies, right? So I learned the hard way. But here are these two sons... And when these people are bringing a sacrifice to them, in verse 14 it says, whenever the fork brought up, whenever the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is how they treated the Israelites who would come to Shiloh. But even before the fat was burned for God, say for God, the priest's servant would come in and say to the person who was sacrificing, hey, you know what, Chris? You know, before you offer all of that good stuff to God, I kind of like this cut of meat right here. So I'm going to go, I'm going to just take that for myself because I'm pretty certain God doesn't need that. I'm just going to keep that for myself. <clears throat> Looks like steak again. So who were they stealing from? God. Now when you're dealing with God and sin in the Old Testament, 
the consequences were pretty steep sometimes. Let's just remember that as we move forward. In verse 17, it says, The sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. So then we've got Eli, this judge of Israel. If you're Eli, so Chris, here you've given your offering. I'm one of the sons. I cheated you out of your offering to God because, well, I think I needed to have it more. If you walked away from that, how would you feel about the two sons of Eli? Not so good. Would you want them to be punished for that? Darn right. So here, Eli has an opportunity to deal with that, but he didn't deal with that. But did God see everything that was going on? Absolutely. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 27, the, the section title is entitled, Prophecy Against the House of Eli. In verse 27 it says, Now a man came to Eli and said to him, This is what the Lord says. Did I not clearly reveal myself to your ancestors' family when they were in Egypt under Pharaoh and chose your ancestors out of all of the tribes of Israel to be my priests, to go up to the altar, to burn incense, and to wear an ephod in my presence? I also gave your ancestors' family all of the food offerings presented to the Israelites. Why do you score my sacrifices and offer that, fat, that, that I prescribed for my dwelling? Why do you honor your sons more than me by fattening yourselves on the choice parts of every offering made by my people Israel? Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promise that members of your family will minister before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it for, from me, those who honor me, I will honor. But those who despise me, I will disdain. I will be, who despise me will be disdained. The time is coming when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your priestly house so that no one in it will reach old age. So stop right there for a second. Imagine that. Chris is sitting here going, you know what? I'm kind of ticked. I'm going to go home and I'm going to pray with my wife. Lord, I feel like that was kind of wrong that those sons acted wrongly and selfishly. And you know what, Lord? If it be your will, I just ask that you would kind of punish them. And God responds and it's like, boom! You will never live long in your lifetime. All of the men's lives are going to be cut short. And what happens to your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, will be assigned to you they will both die on the same day. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will firmly establish his priestly house and they will minister before the anointed one always. This brings us to the life of Samuel. Samuel was a miracle child. Can you say miracle child? Miracle child. Can you think of any other miracle child in the Bible? Jesus. Okay, what about John the Baptist? Isaac, Ishmael, Esau. Now Samuel's name means name of God or God has heard. God is faithful to hear our hearts when we call out to him from the depths of our hearts. I want to give you an example. My wife and I got pregnant with our son. And at the time, guess what I was thinking of naming him? Samuel. We later ended up calling him Ethan because we were pretty certain that rather than calling him Samuel, people were going to call him Sammy, and well, that made my wife cringe. So we went with Ethan. But Samuel means strong. It means firm. It means an honor to God. God has heard my cries. Kate was pregnant with Ethan. We go in for an ultrasound. In the ultrasound, we find out that the placenta is pulling away in the first trimester. We don't know if Ethan is going to make it to term. So we prayed a specific prayer. We looked at Jesus' life as the prototype. 
And in Luke 2.52, it says, And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and favor with man. So we prayed that over him every day. We got close to the time when we were expecting Kate to give birth to Ethan. And I had a dream. And in that dream, Ethan's born, but he doesn't look good. And as things progress, these nurses are working on him. And I didn't know if he was going to live or die. And all of a sudden, he starts pinking up. And I'm like, relieved. But then, in the dream, I look over at my wife, and here is Kate, white as a ghost. And she goes into shock, and they start working on her, but it's too late. And she passes away. This was two weeks before Ethan was born. Did I share that with my wife? No, I did not share that with my wife. That would not be encouraging. But I went before the Lord from that time I had that dream and fasted, prayed, cried out to God for my wife, for my son. And then when we were in the delivery room, things started happening. Ethan was born. He didn't look good. They're working on him. He was a huge baby. He was a 10-pound baby. Not quite the 8-pound baby that they had said that we were going to have. 10-pound baby on a placenta that was pulling away. And then I look over at Kate, and here's Kate White. I remember having worship music on in the room and just trusting God. And fortunately... God intervened, and my wife is here with me today. To have our next child, Elizabeth, who she slept all the way up to five minutes until Elizabeth was born. The easiest birth I've ever seen. (laughs) The reason I share that is, sometimes God will bring you to that point of just crying out in desperation to go before you to bring about a miracle. Samuel was definitely a miracle. Hannah brought Samuel to the temple. Samuel was presented, and he's going to be trained up by those that are in the temple. So who's the number one person training in the temple? Eli. Eli ran into a problem while he was in the temple. You know what his problem was? I borrowed these from Kate. Mine aren't. Hot pink. Really. So I can't hear too well in these. You guys could shout all you want, and I probably wouldn't hear much. But imagine I'm Eli, and I go about my work, offering, bless you, awesome, great, I'm going to bed. But really, One thing is a problem. I'm the priest in the house of the Lord, but I don't have my listening ears on. As a matter of fact, sorry if I was talking loud. As a matter of fact, Eli wasn't hearing anything. See, he had grown so cold to hearing God's voice that something happened with Samuel. Here's Samuel If we fast forward to chapter 3, verse 2, it says that at that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim, meaning he's kind of like this, he couldn't see. He was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel and said, Here I am. The Lord called Samuel and he said, Here I am. Kate, did you hear my voice? How'd you know it was me? Jim? 
How'd you know I was calling on you? Okay, and I used your name. So here is Samuel, and the Lord called to Samuel, and he said, here I am. Samuel has this experience with God where he's woken up at night. What's your name? Tevin? It's pretty cool. I think that E-V-I-N is pretty cool. Kind of like K-E-V-I-N too. So that's, those are cool names. Just partially to them. But imagine if you're sleeping and all of a sudden you hear Tevin. Is your first thought going to be, man, I think that might be God speaking to me. May not be, right? Tevin, you're going to be listening and going, do I recognize that voice? Is that somebody I know? Is it one of my family? Is it somebody close to me? I don't know. And the same thing happened to Samuel. Samuel's in the temple. He hears God's voice. Who does he think it is immediately? Eli. It's not Eli. So finally, at this point, Samuel has heard his name twice. He comes up. Eli, what do you want? Eli's like, I don't want anything. And then it finally dawns on Eli that it might be God speaking to him. So he says, when you hear the voice again, respond and say, here I am, speak, your servant is listening. So God goes ahead, Samuel goes ahead, lays down, and for the third time, the Lord called to Samuel again for the third time, verse 8, and he rose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling that boy. Verse 9. So here's Eli. It takes him three times to start realizing that God is trying to speak. And here's what I would ask this question. If Eli is in the temple and his job is to be the priest, who do you think God wants to speak to? The priest. So how, I, I tend to wonder if you've got this little child that is in the temple, how many times did God try to speak to Eli and he missed it, and he missed it, and he missed it, before he finally spoke to a child to get our attention. You can hear God speaking, but not recognize that it's God. You may not recognize God's voice the first time you hear it. You may not recognize a feeling that you get. You may not recognize a picture that you get. You might not know where it's coming from. You might go, hey, is this coming from me? Man, I slept weird last night. I had just crazy dreams. Verse 9. Eli finally directs him to go back and say your servant is listening. Sometimes God places people in our lives to help us hear or recognize God's revealing himself. In this case, Eli, even though he was not walking in full obedience to God, still was used as a coach. Right before service, I'm kind of back here, and I'm just praying, and somebody comes up to me and shares a word with me. Maria gets a word from God, feels like she has something to share with me, but has to make a decision. Do I just keep this to me? Is this for me or is this for Kevin? What if I go and I share this with Kevin and he doesn't understand what it means? Or, bet, or, or worse, what if, what if I go and share with Kevin and he doesn't like me because of what I share with him? 
These are some of the same things that Samuel had to process because as we move forward, Eli kind of presses Samuel. So, how many of you in here are a parent? Raise your hand. So, if your son or daughter came to you and said, I think God spoke to me in a dream, how many of you would inquire and say, what did He say to you? It'd be important, right? Eli was the same way. I think he may have been more surprised. But here's what God says. Verse 11, Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears. Can you say two ears? Two ears. Everyone who hears will will tingle. And that day I will fulfill against Eli what I had spoken to him concerning his house from the beginning to the end. So here Eli gets to listen to this boy prophesy to him the very same thing that the man, the servant who came earlier had given a warning and said, Eli, get your house in order or I'm going to do these things. Eli didn't do those things. And here, instead of sending some mighty man of God, some Samson, some whoever, he sends this boy who's committed his life to God to share a word. And so we go through a transition. Samuel becomes a prophet right there as a little boy, prophesying to Eli. Sometimes that's a great risk to step out. Sometimes God calls us to speak out of obedience even when it's not popular. I tend to wonder, let's see here. You back there, second, second chair. Yeah, what's your name? Addison? So if you're sitting in the, in the back there and in the middle of service, God speaks to you and he says, you know what, I have a word for you that I want you to share with Kevin up front. And by the way, I want you to go share a word of warning with him. Would you be a little bit scared? Probably. Would it test your faith? Yeah, it would test your faith. But I want to ask you this. Rather than focusing on you, Addison... Sorry, I'm not trying to embarrass you. But rather than focusing on you, if you've got God looking down on you and he's whispered in your ear and he's shared something, do you think maybe God is sitting here going, I can't wait to see how Addison responds. I can't wait to see if she's going to be faithful to walk up and share that. And you know what? I can't wait until she's faithful to do that and she's going to come up here because I've made her spirit like this to come up and share words of truth. Am I getting more accurate here about you? To share a word of truth and God saying this and going, you know what, Addison? Because you were faithful with that one word I gave you, I know that I can give you more revelation. I can show you more things. I can give you more visions. You are precious to me. Your gifts are precious to me. I want to bless you. I want to use you to be a blessing to others so that they know my love, my heart, my passion for them. And don't worry when people think you're weird. Just be obedient to what I'm putting on you and your heart in the moment and I'll bless your steps. And something just happened there. I was using this as an example for Addison's life. But as I started speaking in example about Addison, what I started realizing is God wanted to say something to Addison. Do you recognize that, Addison? Okay. Okay. I thank God that he's placed you for such a time as this with the gifts and the skills and the talents to walk out life like Samuel. 
to walk out and be a blessing, to speak. But sometimes that's going to be great risk. I'm going to share something personal with you. I wasn't going to share something personal with you, but then when I have an individual that comes up and talks to me before service and gives me a prophetic word, then I realize I, God's given me a choice. And I have a choice whether or not I walk out the things that I'm called to, to walk out. Thank you, Maria, for being faithful to walk that out and to come and, and share with me in the moment. Because otherwise, I think sometimes we stop short. Sometimes we just need that little encouragement to go one step farther in faith to be faithful to God with what he's putting on your heart. I'll give you an example. I was in a church recently, and if you've ever looked at um, the books in the New Testament regarding the Corinthians, there's a couple chapters in there where Paul's having to do some house cleaning because they were getting a little bit unruly with some of the spiritual gifts. They were getting wild. They were letting it all hang out. And Paul was like, hang on a second. Time out. We need to get this in order. Recently, Kate and I were at a church. And it's a church where we're trying to fit in. It's a church where we weren't kicking down doors. We were trying to grow relationally. But there were things that, that I kept hearing, kept sensing from the heart of God where he's like, wait a second. There's stuff that's kind of running amok with the prophetic. And so what steps did God guide me to, to walk through with that? Well, first and foremost, I can have my pastoral credentials, but if I'm in a church and I'm not the lead pastor, I'm going to go to the lead pastor because they've been delegated responsibility over that house. It's not my job to go cut the legs out of a pastor. So I go to the pastor and I share. But then there was one morning where God woke me up at 4.30 in the morning. And he just flat out said, write down these words that I give to you. So I write in the 21st century way. I'm typing it out. Boom, 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 boom. And I share a word that morning. And I'm reading what God has given me. And essentially it was, there are things happening that shouldn't be happening. There is applause happening for things that are not of my spirit. And I want to bring a greater sense of discernment. I want to bring a greater sense of awareness of what I'm doing in the life of the church right now. And you know what? Part of me, that morning, I had to work through fear. God, but if I give this word, they might not like me here. Matter of fact, if I give this word, that might break any possibility of doing certain things with leadership in the future here. And God put it on my heart to be like, you know what, Kevin? You need to deliver this word. So I shared the word. After I had shared the word, I had a conversation with the pastor. The pastor wasn't exactly excited about what I had to share. But I still felt like I needed to share. And from that point on, Kate and I talked about it, things started changing in the prophetic in that church to get more level, to not be out of balance. And it wasn't because I shared the Word. It's because sometimes when you share what God's given you, there's a release. His words are not meant to fall to the ground. They're meant to do something. They're meant to have action. I think it was the, just the releasing of the Word. Release God's hand to be able to start changing things. I'll give you another example. Pre-9-11. You know what I was doing pre-9-11? Well, on September 10th, I was doing this. I wasn't mowing. I was, I was pushing a 36-inch wide vacuum up and down a very large church's hallways. 
making the camera guy keep up with me. But there was one thing that I would ask every morning when I would show up to do that because I was an intern and I was also working part-time at the church. So it kind of looked like this. I'm pushing. See if you see a, a, a similarity to what we're sharing today. Jesus, speak to me. What's on your heart today? What's on your heart today? And I stopped dead in my tracks because I watch what I, I can only describe as watching TVs and watching a newsreel of what was going to happen less than 24 hours later. And you know what? Even though I was a little older than Samuel, I still had the same response. You know what my response was? Pastor, what do I do with this? I had this dream. This is what I saw. And the pastor lovingly said, I'm not sure. Let's pray. Let's see what God does here. Now for the life of me, I don't know why God reveals things like that. But I'm starting to understand that those things are in preparation for other things in life. And it's if we're faithful with those things. Imagine if, if you have a 10-year-old in here, or younger, and all of a sudden they get a dream, and they go to Pastor Brooke or Pastor Jim, or Jennifer, Francisco, anybody here, and they're like, I had this dream, and it ends up being this profound, revelatory dream that's strategic, it shows God's heart, and maybe something for the world. And you go, wow, that's right here in Alliance. That can't happen here in Alliance. That can only happen in big churches, big mega churches. You know where revival's going on. But here's what I love about coming to Alliance. People's hearts incline to God. Speak, Lord. Speak. We want to hear you. We want to know you. I shared on a panel 2018, going down the line, people are getting the mic. It's at a church. It's a prophetic council. You had three minutes to share. Part of my three minutes, we're, we're going, and people are like, yeah, that's awesome, that's awesome. And they get to me, and I go, I'm going to start with a question. What do we do when the churches get shut down worldwide for something that affects the world in a way that we have never seen before? What is the, the church going to do to be ready for that? And does God have a plan? I wish I could tell you that when you're around like-minded individuals that have similar gift mix, and I'm around all these people that are prophetic and they hear from God, that you go, you know what? There's no better place to share something like that because they're going to like get it. They're going to know what to do with it and they're going to process it. That's not necessarily true. Because walking out of there, people are like, that's crazy. What came right after it? COVID. And the churches were scrambling to get ready for it. Maria, I wasn't going to share any of this. Thank you for your faithfulness. God, I pray that you pour out more revelation, more blessing, and more courage over Maria to step out when she knows that it's coming from you. In Jesus' name. 18 months ago, I was in a pulpit like this in a smaller church. And I had shared something. Actually, it was 17 months ago. And I had shared that the next 18 months would look weird going into a season that if you could imagine Pearl Harbor, 9-11, and the Cuban Missile Crisis all wrapped up in one, something that was going to get the attention of the world, that that's coming. But, can you say but? If you look in Scripture and God speaks doom and speaks challenge or speaks warning, if there's a word that says but or therefore, 
I'm going to look at that part because maybe God has a plan. Maybe God has a blessing. You know what I like about preaching here? If I speak God's truth or I speak discernment, it doesn't bounce off your hearts. I think God is well pleased that you are a people who are like, God, we're going to be mindful that when we hear your word, we're going to process it. We're going to test it. We're going to be like the Bereans who are more noble than the Thessalonians because after they hear, they go and they test to see if what they're hearing is true. I think that's one of the things that God loves about this church. But I said that was 17 months ago. Do you know what 18 months is? May. Do I believe something's coming in May? Yeah. But, here's what I'd like to speak in terms of peace. We're going to see things that are going to, in our minds, might kind of just blow our minds and go, I can't believe this is happening. But God's truth is going to say this. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to keep you. You're going to be blessed. This is going to be more for show and fear than truth. When the kids are watching television and they want to be scared, I hope that the kids here today can go, I don't, I don't fear because I know that we're going to be okay. Even though the television is going to be saying something different. I believe we're walking into a time of revival. There was something that happened when you move from judges to prophets. Samuel was one of the last judges. He was one of the first prophets in the age of the prophets. During that time, it says that prophecy or revelation or vision, all kind of summed up in a similar word used in the the books of the prophets, that it was a rare thing. So here, after years and years of this, not hearing anything, God speaks and He releases truth. I think there are a lot of churches right now that are crying for revival. I think the revival that's coming comes to the churches and to the people that are ready to respond the churches that are ready to react to God, the churches that are ready to be faithful. I want you to imagine... Kate, can I borrow you for a second? Can you come up here? I just want you to imagine for a moment that Kate... Come on over. Kate and I just happen to be neighbors of these guys. Go ahead and sit behind me. And all of a sudden, we're watching television and things in the world look like they're going nuts. And people are going to the store doing panic buying. And maybe these two live next to somebody that doesn't know Jesus, doesn't go to church, doesn't have the peace that they might have in being able to trust in God. What advice would you give Lord, I pray that you would just bless that baby. (laughs) I've been waiting for that. Lord, and I pray for a good mothership. (laughs) What advice would you give? What advice would you give to this couple here living next to us when we're panicking, we're scared? or watching things happen, what advice would you have for them being a fellow believer in Christ? So if you've been blessed by God, what does He want you to do? Be a blessing. You can be a comforter. You can speak peace into a situation. But you know what else could happen? I could be sitting there and I could ask one profound question. And this is one profound question I really could see myself. If I was 
if I hadn't yet believed in Jesus Christ, if I didn't know about His saving grace, I would look here and go, how are you guys so calm about all of this? You know what their answer could be? Keeping our eye on Jesus. And so all of a sudden, they're able to share and witness to their neighbors. I believe we're coming into that time where God is raising up many Samuels. Many, many, many Samuels. One of the things that they're looking for is they're looking for a relationship with God. And the thing that God has always wanted is a relationship with Him. I'm going to end by going back to the beginning. Do you remember that cycle or that pattern of chaos that they had in the time of Judges? Israel experiences peace. Then they do evil in the sight of God and sin. Israel experiences distress, war, and slavery. Israel cries out to God and repents for their action. God raises up a judge or a leader. And lastly, God rescues Israel. You know what that foreshadows? I was a college student. I thought I had peace, but I was still searching. I go into college. I sin. I'm experiencing crisis. I'm in a hospital bed. Had surgery, emergency surgery. I'm going like this with a morphine pump. And in the middle of all of that, I cry out, God, if you are real, I pray that you move in this situation that I'm in and take care of things that are so big that I can't even take care of them. And number two, that you would speak to me. And number three, that you would send somebody to talk to me about who you are. And can I tell you, in six months, <laughs> in one month, God dealt with an unhealthy relationship that I had with a girlfriend. I found myself single. And then all of a sudden, this guy named Dan starts sharing with me Scripture, and we're processing it. And then all of a sudden, I hear God speaking into my heart that He wants to be my Father, and He wants me to be His Son. And He wants to heal me. He wants to restore me. And He wants to show me a life and fulfill promises that I couldn't even imagine. See, Judges is a forerunner to the New Testament church. God is calling for a boldness. God's calling for a relationship with Him so that we can be relational with the world. So that we can give the world a good picture of what God's heart is, His character is, His nature, so that they can have purpose, they can have life, and they can have meaning in the middle of chaos, crisis, trials, loneliness, all the above. My question for you for this week is, just everybody close your eyes for just a second. If you were speaking to the Father right now, and you said, Father God, what are the obstacles that are getting in the way of me hearing you? What are the things that are like the earmuffs over my ears of my heart? God, what are the things that are taking priority in my life? God, are there things like Eli that I've let slide? God, is there things that I need to be rescued of? If I'm honest with myself, are there areas of sin that I can't fix myself? And it's only by Your hand that You come in and You deliver me in those areas. God, is there something that You're speaking to me in this season that, like Samuel, You've spoken over and over, but I want to be obedient with what You're giving me right now? 
Lord, I pray that you speak mightily to every person in this room. God, I ask in the name of Jesus that you release healing over this house, physical healing over anybody that's afflicted in the body. God, that you would release ears to hear. God, I pray that you would block out time, that you would block out nooks in our schedule just for you. Just like the first fruits that are offered in the temple, God, that we would begin to give first fruits to you in some of the cluttered schedules that we have. Lord, I pray that and ask you that you would raise up a standard of prayer in this house so that this is like an open conduit to the heavens. That even though it be alliance and people will say, oh, we could never hear those big mighty things. Lord, I pray that those big mighty things would be released in this house. And God, we thank you that you love us and that you're with us walking hand in hand. God, we thank you for the Holy Spirit, the New Testament church that has the great counselor to walk with us and assist us in all of the things that we do. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.